Now, why did our ancestors believe that the earth was flat and that the sun was moving, you know, not moving, sun was static, earth was, you know, sort of, sun was moving or not, yes. from rising in the east and then going to the set. So, there is a movement of sun also. So, why, why did they believe like that? Based on whatever they are seeing. They, what, what they can see in real life. They can see. No, she was saying something. Lack of knowledge uh, among the people uh, and also uh, the people can't go outside of the world and see the earth size from or above. the shape from hmm? outside. Yeah. So that belief continued for years. And I remember the, the tragic plight of Bruno who was burned alive for saying that earth was, you know, round. And even uh, in the time of Aristotle, that belief system continued for thousands of years. Now, what about our belief about learning a language? What is the popular belief about a uh, human child learning mother tongue? What do people believe about learning language? You know? Through imitation and repetition. Through imitation. So, imitating whom? Imitating the mothers or the All right. uh, people around them. Yeah. So, this is a very strong belief. The child learns the language through imitation. Okay? and also through repetition, repeating the same thing again and again. Hmm? And uh, in those days it was believed that the mind is like, a, like an empty slate. A very serious question is there, does the newborn child know anything about language? Now probably we know, but most people do not know that. Okay? So, they believe that you know everything regarding language comes from outside. It's so in, in the case of mother tongue, and it is naturally so in the case of English also, because there is no speech community around. There's no one to imitate also. So through imitation and repetition, if mother tongue is learned, you have to provide the same situation in the classroom for imitating and uh, <coughs> repeating the same thing. And precisely that has been happening in the classrooms also. How children are doing that. So, there are certain belief systems promoted by a certain school of thought. Today we call them the behaviorist uh, schools kind of thing. Hmm? Let us see what these assumptions are. I will just uh, you can look at the screen. The child's mind is like an empty slate which is tabula rasa which gets filled with experience from the speech community. Language is a behavioral manifestation which can be accounted in terms of stimulus and response. Now, we are just talking about the belief systems promoted by the behavioral schools. You know. Language is a baggage of language elements like sounds, letters or structures, functions, idioms, usages, etc. Language is a skill subject as against subjects like physics or chemistry which are known as content subjects. Okay? And language is skill subject means it is manifested through the skills like listening, speaking, reading and writing. Uh, we are very familiar with that LSRW. Now, if the students make some errors, these errors are to be corrected as and when they are made, otherwise they will be negatively reinforced. And once it is negatively reinforced, it will be difficult to get rid of these errors. So, these are the uh, popular beliefs and these beliefs were you know strengthened by uh, you know, uh, behavioral school of psychology. Not only that, uh, there was a, a, a kind of philosophy called empiricism. You can see the name of John Locke behind that who says that the mind is a tabula rasa. So, in fact, there are three schools of thought with uh, which converged you now. On the one hand, there was a behaviorist school and then the empiricists and also the structuralists, you know, who explained the structure of sentence. So, these uh, things had a very strong influence on designing the uh, curriculum, designing the textbooks and deciding the methodology for teaching language. And if you remember, you know, uh, in your school days, probably you were studying uh, something called graded series of textbooks. The idea is that you know some structures and vocabulary terms are introduced in lower classes. The higher you go, there will be more number of structures and more number of 
vocabulary items and these things are uh, you know uh, put into the lesson and there are questions on that questions related to vocabulary grammar everything and ultimately it is believed that by learning these elements of language like structures or usages or idioms the learners will be able to use language this was the uh, way how uh, these schools of thought behaviorism and empiricism and structuralism influenced the whole uh, course of language teaching now this situation changed when in 1957 Noam Chomsky came out with a claim on human languages saying that the language is a genetic endowment for human beings. It is not that language is coming from outside, but every child is equipped with a language device. In early days it was named as language acquisition device, today we uh, call it the universal grammar. It is not the la grammar of any particular language but possibly the, the grammar of all possible human languages. Okay. Now, let us try to understand some of the claims uh, in this uh, uh, innateness theory of Chomsky. You can listen to a talk by Chomsky. You know. We want to look at language as a normal biological system, some module of the organism. Uh, then the standard questions for any module arise at once. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, what, how, and why questions. What are the properties of the acquired system, uh, each one regarded as an internal system of an individual? Uh, how are these properties acquired? Uh, and uh, why do they have these properties and not some other properties? Well, perhaps the most elementary property of human language is that it consists of a discrete infinity of interpretable expressions. So there's five word sentences and six word sentences and no five and a half word sentence and it goes on indefinitely like the integers. Now that's kind of unusual. There's nothing like that known in the biological world. So that's one isolated property. I mean maybe down to the level of DNA. Uh, what it means is that each speaker, each child has somehow internalized a computational process, what's called a generative process that yields an infinite array of hierarchically structured expressions. So, uh, the core of you know the innate, innate, innateness theory of uh, Chomsky is that human beings are born with uh, language, which today we call universal grammar, it is also known as the principles and uh, parameters. Well, for language, we can analyze the genetic endowment into a component specific to human language, standard term for that is universal grammar, UG, and other uh, uh, components of the genetic endowment uh, that uh, um, somehow are relevant to language uh, development, so other cognitive systems, uh, neurophysiological structures, and so on. Now, what do you mean by principles and parameters? You know that all languages have something common and whatever are the common properties of languages we can put under principles and those properties which are language specific you can call them as parameters. Okay? Now, to understand this concept uh, let us uh, try to know what we mean by parameters. Now, how do you say the idea? John ate a mango in your language. John ate a mango. In your language, how will you say? What is the language? Uh, how will you say it? John Am Kaya. Uh, John Am Kaya Hai. How will you say it in your language? John Am Toa. Okay. It's John Mango ate. Yes. Okay. John Mambarati Tindran. Tindran. John Amba Kado. Uh, so, look at the, all these languages, one is you know uh, Tamil, the one is you know uh, and your language is uh, Hindi. In all these languages you can see that you have the object first you know, let us say the complement of the verb comes first and comes the verb. John Mango ate, but in English you have uh, in order you get the verb first 
and then the object. So, you look at the structure A to mango, we call it the verb phrase and the verb phrase the verb is the head. So, there are languages where the head comes initially and the complement appears after that and there are Indian languages where the head appears at the end of the structure. So, let us say this is one of the parametric differences you know and this is captured in the universal grammar the newborn child uh, you know in that universal grammar this parametric value will not be set. So, the newborn child has two options either to choose for the head initial option or the head final option and based on the minimal or the optimal input the child gets the value of this parameter is set in one way or the other. And there are other parameters also you know which are related to universal grammar and language learning in from this point of view means setting the value of each of these parameters. It has nothing to do with you know learning grammar or you know practicing idioms nothing of that kind. So, when the child gets the uh, you know the meaningful input it could be optimal input not the quantity of uh, input, but the quality of the input that the child gets the value of each parameters are set. So, in the case of mother tongue it is happening and you have already a set values for the uh, for the grammar you know in, in your inbuilt grammar. Now, in the case of second language this parametrics values are to be reset. So, in learning English it is a question of resetting the parameters parametric values. Now, it cannot be taught now these things cannot be taught universal grammar cannot be taught. Now, please do not you know uh, confuse universal grammar with the grammar that is appearing in the grammar books later we will also see what is the problem with the those grammar books also. So, this is a concept. Now, Chomsky has put forward a number of arguments to show uh, that behavior behaviorist theories on language does not work. Okay. Now, one classic argument is the, uh, what he calls the poverty of stimulus argument. It simply means that the stimulus is uh, sort of uh, very very impoverished whereas, the response is enormous. Now, examine the kind of language input the child gets you know most families are now living uh, like nuclear families. So, um, the input that child gets is very minimal or rather optimal kind of thing. Nobody talks to child always in using continuous sentences and full sentences full short sentences it is broken utterances sometimes fragments. So, whether it is you know whether broken or not at the age of 2 the child starts producing language the child can talk about almost anything ok talk about his desire likes dislikes anything. So, if you look at the stimulus response you know argument here the stimulus is very impoverished whereas, the response is enormous. So, how do you account for that unless there is something called innateness this language could not have been produced by the human children. And also uh, another problem is that you know uh, the psychologists like Pablo or Skinner or in Thorndike they had experimented on animal behavior okay. and animal behavior is rather predictable. Now, how can we uh, extend in a theory that works on predictable behavior to a species whose behavior is totally unpredictable. And there are other reasons also why the behavioral uh, claims on language uh, does not you know hold. And also from neurobiology you have further evidence. Now, there are two areas in the left hemisphere which are called Broca's area named after the scientist and also Wernick's area which are related to language reception and also production. Okay. So, the linguistic information is you know encoded in the human brain in the form of synaptic connections you know and this information is you know located in the left hemisphere in two small clusters of neurons called Broca's area and also Wernick's area. And there are I know um, you know researchers for example, Jane Atchison who said language behavior is a biologically triggered behavior. 
like walking or sexual behavior. Now, let us try to understand what we mean by a biologically triggered off behavior. It is not just a behavioral change. Now, remember the behavioral psychologists were claiming that language learning is a, is a verbal behavior. Now, the modification here is, it is not just a behavior, but biologically triggered behavior. It simply means that there are certain uh, milestones for that. How does the human child start walking, you know? The newborn child just cannot stand on the two uh, legs and start walking. So, what are the uh, milestones for walking? It has to turn on one side, lie on its belly, crawl, you know, sit holding on something, stand up. No, hu no human uh, child can skip these stages. And no enthusiastic mother can put the child uh, on uh, two legs and start teaching how to walk. It is not possible. Mothers are more sensible <coughs> than teachers, you know, <laughs> they do not do that. Uh, like the language also, there are certain milestones. For example, crying is uh, one of the milestones of uh, language, maybe the newborn child cries, then uh, it produces some uh, sort of, you know, the babbling is there, produce some sounds. At the age of one, it produces some one word utterances. At the age of two, it produces two word utterances. Let us have a look at the different milestones of uh, language, you know. Yeah, uh, you can look at the screen. Now, crying happens at birth, cooing six weeks, babbling six months, intonation patterns eight months, one word utterances one year, two word utterances 18 months and word inflections 2 years, questions negatives you know when 2 years and 3 months, rare or complex constructions 5 years and mature speech in 10 years. These are milestones. And the, uh, the properties of you know a biologically triggered behavior also is something uh, uh, very noteworthy. Let us see what these are. Now, just uh, think about language. Newborn child, is language absolutely necessary for the human child to survive? No. We cannot say no, we cannot be, uh, it is a possibility, may or may not be. But even if there is no absolute need for language, the child produces language. Now, the child uh, does not have to ask for food, mother knows and mother feeds the child. Okay. So, there is no need for the child to use language. In spite of that, language develops. Okay. Now, again, now recall how we learned mother tongue. Was it the result of a conscious decision on our part? No. Did you decide, you know, okay, tomorrow onwards I am going to speak <laughs> mother tongue, does not happen, you know. Maybe in practicing a skill, you know, you can have a decision like that. So, you can practice on how to throw a, a javelin and uh, hit uh, a target. You can practice it. Now, cycling is a skill that you can improve through practicing. Swimming is a skill that you can improve through practicing. So, are language skills are something that can be improved through practicing? This is a question. If so, which of these skills can be improved through practicing? Just like swimming, just like cycling. Now, when you talk about LSRW, the implication is that if you practice these skills, language will be learned. This really happens so. Now, take a case of a class 5 child. You write an English passage, teaches the child you know, how to articulate every, every word, you know, using all voice modulation, everything, all these articulated features and make the child produce it. That child can probably reproduce the text exactly the way you want it to do. But can you claim that child has learned that language? So, the question is, does practicing directly lead to learning language? Do you practice mother tongue? If you do not practice mother tongue, why should you practice English? What do you mean by practice? Put to use. Put to use. Putting use is not practicing. <laughs> you know? the, the common understanding about practicing is that you do repeatedly the same thing again and again till you master it. Just like cycling, a skill, you can keep on doing it, you know, 
you know, and that is the implication of practicing. But language is not uh, occurred in that way. It's not that way. And probably you uh, land up with learning some words or sentences or some total passages. That's all. Being in the language environment may be developing, like uh, may it may develop the language. Uh, of course, uh, an environment is needed, you know. So this is one of the argument. Now, for example, <coughs> when Chomsky came out, came out with the language in his theory, uh, people were asking the question: Okay, if the newborn child has uh, already a language, you know, uh, inbuilt language, why doesn't the human child start speaking language the moment it is born? Now, uh, this question uh, appears to be a very, very uh, reasonable question. Okay, at the same time, you can ask a number of uh, counter questions also. Now, the newborn child has all the systems intact. It has a physical system, let's see, biological system like a respiratory system, skeletal system, tissue system, everything is intact. Then why doesn't the newborn child start walking the moment it's born? Needs a kind of maturation. That's why uh, we call it say biologically triggered behavior. At the age of two, every human child starts speaking a language, but the environment is very crucial. But not to the extent that you know, everything regarding language is coming from, from the environment. So, the ultimate question is whether language is a social construct or an individual construct. If you look for the, uh, the, the Marxian theories, we say language is a social construct. No single human being can construct a language. Okay? At the same time, only human beings can produce language. Even if you train a gorilla or a chimpanzee for weeks and years together, there is no record evidence that it can uh, learn any language. So, it is something very species specific, only the human um, species has the ability to produce language. Okay. And uh, another thing is that you know, okay, you have to wait for the inner system to start working, you know, certain maturity uh, is to be occurred by the human brain kind of thing. Before that certain things cannot be occurred, you know. So, acquisition is a biologically triggered process that way. Certain relevant synaptic connections are to be formed in the uh, Broca's area and the Wernicke's area, then only it comes out as language. And again, uh, we are talking about what is the relevance of you know the nature outside. Now, take the case of puberty. You know, we know that human beings attain puberty line at a certain age, and we s believe that it's a biologically uh, decided phenomenon. Now, what is the role of nurturing in that? Suppose the child does not get proper nourishment, if it is undernourished, either it can be delayed or it can also not happen, both possibilities are there. So, the environment also is very crucial, okay. But what you get from the environment, it is a very optimal kind of uh, thing that the child is received from the environment. So, that is why people like Steven Pinker say it is not the quantity of uh, input which matters, but the quality of uh, input the child gets. Now, how do you translate all these into classroom, uh, you know, uh, transaction? That is another question. But these are uh, uh, theoretical, you know, findings which have a lot of pedagogical implication. So, let us talk about what was the effect of Chomsky theory on uh, the claims on language and language learning. I will just look at uh, the screen. Yeah, first look at the claims on uh, language as a biologically triggered behavior. Property number one, the behavior emerges before it is necessary. As we said, the child gets food even though it, it does not ask for food. Its appearance is not the result of a conscious decision. Its emergence is not triggered by external events. Direct teaching and intensive practice have relatively very little effect. Mothers probably do not teach anything. I do not know there could be mothers who try to teach also. There is a regular sequence of milestones as the behavior develops. We already said what the milestones are. And there may be a critical period for the acquisition of language. But this point has been debated later because there is something called brain plasticity. So, even adults can acquire a language. Sometime earlier it was thought that 12 years is the critical period you know. So, after that the ability to acquire language diminishes you know, but that assumption has been questioned later on. So, 
Today we talk about the brain plasticity which means that at any stage the acquisition process can uh, happen kind of thing. So the convergence of theoretical linguistics and then uh, experiential pedagogy and neurobiology, uh, cognitive psychology has you know derived new insights into language pedagogy. So we have you know a few assumptions regarding language and also language pedagogy. Look at the screen. Language is man's biological system which gets unfolded. Okay. Language acquisition is a non-conscious process. Simply means nobody takes a deliberate decision. Okay, tomorrow onwards I am going to speak a language. It just happens. Uh, psychologists call it subconscious process, but I am using layman's terminology: non-conscious process. Language is acquired not through learning and practicing isolated language facts such as words, structures, but through clusters of linguistic expressions involved in the reception production of discourses. Uh, I think we had a discussion on what we mean by discourses. Any unit larger than the sentence like conversation, description, narrative, poem, song, you know, drama script, everything which you find in print media like newspaper or, or magazines or in the visual media, these are the things. Uh, the discrete units of language like words and structures cannot exist. You know. Right. Language is not the totality of the four skills that is LSRW, but the inner competence manifest in the performance of these skills. The implication is that if you focus on these skills, the knowledge of language may not be available. But if you have innate knowledge of language or if you have knowledge of language or if you have acquired the knowledge of language, these skills will be manifested. So, it is not a two way process. By practicing skills, you cannot have knowledge of language. But if you have knowledge of language, these skills are will be manifested. Okay. Now, language acquisition can take place only in a collaborative <coughs> environment where the child gets ample opportunities to get involved in interpersonal and intrapersonal communication. It is obvious, you know, no human being can singly create a language. A language is occurred not through repetition, but through recurrence, reoccurrence of certain things. It is not repetition. Now, we will understand this uh, terminology in a later lesson. Okay. Now, language acquisition is facilitated not by learning linguistic facts such as vocabulary or grammar, but through the clustering of these facts in meaningful discourses. So, these are the theoretical assumptions for developing the new pedagogy on English language. So, in the coming lessons, we will have a closer look at what this uh, new pedagogy is. Recall some of the points that we discussed. Any anything that comes to your mind, you know. Regarding language. Language is a biologically triggered process. Yeah, it is a biological triggered of process, okay. Right. Behavior. Biological triggered of behavior. Anything else? Uh, what Chomsky said? Uh, language could be learned uh, by a recurrence of certain things, not okay. by repetition. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, what, what exactly is language? Is something that comes from outside or something that is innate? Yeah. This question. So, that is the fundamental point you have to remember. The language module is very much intact in human beings. And what we get from outside is very, very optimum. minimal or optimal. So, we, we talked about poverty of stimulus argument where we said the input is a lot lesser, but then with little input we can enormous language can be produced by the is produced, not is can be produced, okay, is, is produced, produced, you know that is how it is happening. And also the process. And uh, is language is not a conscious uh, Language process. learning. Language learning. Learning is not a conscious process. Okay. So, what normally happens in English classroom is, is it conscious or non-conscious kind of thing? Conscious. Very consciously, the child is conscious, the teacher is conscious that you are teaching and learning English. So, how do you get rid of these things? And we also said language is more collaborative than it is. It is a collaborative environment. I think those are some of the main, main points. Thank you. <laughs>